I've run the New York City Marathon several times. I'm basically an expert. Here's a little preview. Getting to the start line of the New York City Marathon is legendary. Legendarily annoying if you're slow. Hobby joggers will need to take the Staten Island Ferry at 5 a.m. and then get on a bus to Fort Wadsworth in Staten Island, where they will stand around in pajamas and plastic garbage bags for the next three hours. And you'll have plenty of time to size up the competition and judge people based on their shoes. Oh, and there will not be enough porta johns. But if you wanted better accommodations, you should have been faster. If you're fast enough to make Sub Elite, you'll get to take a special bus that goes to the Ocean Breeze Track and Field Complex on Staten Island. This allows you to avoid the ridiculous journey to the start and is a big flex that signals to everybody how fast you are. The pros will be warming up at this track, so it's a great opportunity to get that content. If you're clever, you'll stage a selfie with Molly Seidel in the background and post it with a caption that's like, just warming up with Molly. The transportation issue means that the race starts late, like at 9 a.m., just late enough that it completely messes with how you've practiced fueling long runs. Depending on your wave, you may be on the top or bottom level of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Local lore says that if you're on the bottom of the bridge, you might get rained on, which is just another reason to run faster. Sure, public urination is technically a crime, but you gotta be light for the race. If you're concerned about having to drop, you'd better carry a metro card with you so you can hop on the subway at any point in the race. But only do this if it's absolutely necessary. You do not want to carry those extra grams for no reason and you better have already planted your excuses on Strava. Once the race starts, you technically run on Staten Island for like 10 feet, which is just enough to check the box for all five boroughs. This is the only day you can run over the Verrazano Bridge, which means instant epicness. If anyone has given you advice for the New York City Marathon, they will have told you this. The Verrazano Bridge is not flat. That first mile is uphill, and you'll be caught up in the excitement of the race. You'll be fresh, so you'll be tempted to go out way too fast. People might tell you to hold back or watch your pace until you get over the bridge, but nobody actually does this. Miles two through 15 are relatively flat, and you'll be running through Brooklyn and a little bit of Queens. Even though I believe I'm good enough to be a pro, New York Roadrunners disagrees, which means I won't have elite bottle stations. But mile eight is a great place for your friends to blend into the crowd and hand you a bottle of Morton. Yes, it is technically against USATF rule 144, but I really deserve to have elite bottles, so it's not really cheating. Mile 13 is the Pulaski Bridge. Now, you'll look at your watch and you'll be pleasantly surprised by your splits. It's here that you'll get ambitious about your race. Until about two miles later. Mile 15 is the Queensboro Bridge. And aside from Heartbreak Hill, it is the most difficult hill in all of running. I doubt that any of these so-called trail runners have ever tackled a hill as massive as the Queensboro Bridge. The bridge is eerily quiet, especially after all of the crowds in Brooklyn, which is good because you'll have some time to think. Should I drop out? Do I need to drop because of this climb? If I drop, what's my Strava title going to be? Have I planted enough excuses with my followers? Coming off the bridge is the legendary turn onto First Avenue and into the deafening crowds. And then you're on First Avenue for a while, like a really long while. And you'll hook into the Bronx for a couple of minutes to check the box that you've been to the Bronx. Now watch out for mile 23. Mile 23 is on Fifth Avenue and it's slightly uphill. 
It's not the part of Fifth Avenue where the Fifth Avenue Mile happens. Mile 23 is a great opportunity to pass everybody who's blowing up or to think about your own excuses. After mile 24, you turn into Central Park and they've cut out all of the biggest climbs in Central Park, like Cat Hill and Harlem Hill and the West Side Hills. They've basically made Central Park as flat as Central Park can be. Thank Kipchoge. The finish line is right by Tavern on the Green, so after one last little climb, you're at the finish and the epic race is over. Epic. And then you need to hobble for like two more miles to get your poncho or your drop bag. The race is so crowded that they need to space things out, so they can't just give you your stuff right at the finish. Getting to the start line is a challenge. The climbs will throw you for a loop. You'll nearly freeze to death after you finish. And a trip to New York City is not cheap. But you can't put a price on epicness. And, and just one more thing. While it is technically harder to qualify for New York City than it is to qualify for Boston, there are many, many ways to get into New York. You can do the 9 plus 1 program with New York Roadrunners. You can get in through uh, a local running team. There's a lottery and there are charity slots. So no one assumes that you are fast just because you ran New York City. Therefore, buying your way into New York without a qualifying time is not a heinous, egregious act.